Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth Bridges Live episode. As a reminder, we are building these as a compendium to the series that I did um, over the last few months called Bridges, where we're trying to build a bridge between marketing and finance. We're trying to help marketing leaders become more in-depth in their financial knowledge and finance leaders to understand a little bit more about our world in marketing. And today um, is actually one of my favorite topics. It's something uh, you may have seen me more recently talking more and more about, which is that I feel like my the next wave of my life's mission is to actually help create more liquidity for e-commerce brands, to have see more shareholders realize cash in their pocket. And this episode uh, that I initially did was called uh, Moving from Paper Profits to Liquidity. And it's this idea that as businesses, there's this evolution from trying to generate revenue to trying to generate profit on the P&L to actually growing your bank account, to creating money that you can ultimately put inside of your pocket. So I've dropped in the chat a link. If you haven't watched that episode, I would encourage you to do it. Um, I think it's an important foundation for this topic. And today we're gonna have a couple of amazing uh, entrepreneurs and marketers joining us to discuss this. And I think they are uniquely positioned to share for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that they are bootstrapped. They have had to, from the beginning, build a story where they had to be good at turning capital into more capital, because if they didn't, they wouldn't exist. And that's the beauty of bootstrapping a business is it a, it's a forcing function for developing this skill. But also on top of that, they are in the apparel industry, which is of all the e-commerce categories, maybe the most difficult to produce cash because you are constantly investing in inventory, and there's so many ways to get inventory wrong with sizes and colors and SKUs and trends and et cetera, that it becomes sort of uh, the God mode challenge of e-commerce is to turn an apparel business into a business that produces free cash flow. If you can do that, you guys could start any business in the world and be successful, I think, because it is an immense challenge. So we're very grateful to have them here with us today. They're going to do a quick intro, then I'm going to show you guys something cool, and then we'll get started. But first, let's meet our guests. First up, I have Robert Felder, the founder and CEO of Bare Bottom Clothing and also Josh Firestone, CMO at Bare Bottom Clothing. But Robert, why don't you start with a little bit about what is Bare Bottom Clothing? Give us a little bit about your backstory and who you are, and then Josh will come to you for the same. For sure. So we're a men's e-commerce brand. We just sell direct to consumer through our website. Like we're born digitally native, so we've stuck to that. Um, we sell like activewear, basics, casual, like everything we want to wear throughout our normal day and routine, like anytime we're traveling, that's the product we make. So. We're super connected to the product. Um, when I founded the company, like giving back was always a big part of what I wanted to do. I started the company in college, bootstrapped, kind of like what you mentioned. Uh, so when we founded it, you know, that giving back was in mind. So now what we do is for every item we sell, we donate a school meal to a child in need. And this year we surpassed a million meals donated. So that's been like a really big milestone for us. Um, and like, awesome for our team and to continue to grow. We really want to expand that. Um, outside of that, you know, just like for an e-commerce perspective, like I said, we were founded on that and like, that's how we want to grow and we see a great path for that. Um, we've been in business about 10 years now. So we've kind of seen like the early stages of that, no paid ads and the explosion of that during COVID and e-commerce and now, you know, iOS changes and everything everybody's always talking about. Um, but being bootstrapped and starting really just small and starting in college, the whole like idea behind the business was a business makes money. I didn't really think about like raising money, debt, venture, anything like that it never really crossed my mind. Um, so kind of starting out, that's just how we were formed. But uh, pass over to Josh, I'm sure we'll cover a little bit more after that. Thanks Rob. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been with Bear Bond for about eight years. I met Robert in college and uh, I was studying advertising. So I saw what he was doing. I thought it was really cool, especially with the mission portion. I, I didn't tell he really cared. Um, and I wasn't learning a ton. I felt in my classes and thought it was a cool way to kind of learn as we went with it. Uh, so kind of came in with very little e-commerce experience. And, you, know, you know, it's a whole world that you learn about. Um, and I think it ended up being like an advantage to us because we came in, like we weren't scared to try new things. We were looking and talking to people to get resources. We looked to admission at CTC to learn, we, you know, we're trying to network and, um, having, uh, learn, having to learn it from scratch and then having to not have that, uh, having that, that bootstrapped, uh, component where we couldn't just lean on more capital coming in, uh, 
put us in a really good position, I think, today uh, to have like a really, you know, a stable business that we can focus on growth. We're not worried um, about, you know, having a cash flow issue right now. So let me hear, get some straight. You went to college for advertising? Actually, somebody who is applying their college degree in our industry? That is rare, man. I, I don't know that I've met many people that actually are classically trained in this way. That's cool. Yeah, well, I, I haven't been able to use my, like, uh, magazine sales uh, skills, but some of the other classes that were cool. Used. Not, as, not quite as applicable in, in the same way. And yeah, digital media is a little different. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, well, awesome, guys. Um, all right, before we get started with the questions, I want to share something because, uh, as you all know, if you've joined any of these series before, you know that they exist because of two folks. One is the Zip team and Rohit, who came to me with this idea uh, and helped us to start this. And if you don't know, we should pull up Zamp's site here for you all as we are doing this live. Uh, Zamp is the solution to your sales tax problems. If you are in e-commerce and you want to someday sell your business, if you want to ever file your taxes without it being a giant, enormous headache where you're looking at Nexus in 312 states and figuring out how to do it, Zamp is going to take care of this problem for you. And Rahid is building something really special that is the industry leading solution. They just raised an awesome next round of funding. They're going to be around for a while. There it is right there announcing their next Series A. That's just an indication that they're providing a solution that a lot of brands care about and helps solve a giant headache of a problem. So if you're dealing with sales tax, you're dealing with Nexus, you're thinking about someday uh, having to sell your company or want to manage that solution, Zamp's the way to do it. And Rohit's the man. He will take care of you. And he's the one who brought this to line. And then second, this gets to happen because of our friends at Final Loop. Um, I'm a huge fan. You've probably heard me talk a lot about Final Loop. But one of the things that I love as it relates to this episode um, is that they provide uh, the only real-time cash flow statement that reconciles to your bank accounts in real time. So if you want to manage what we're going to talk about today, if you want to have clear visibility to the state of your finances, this is the best way to do it. Um, so they create these really cool little demos for me to show you guys exactly what this looks like. So you'll see inside of uh, the Final Loop uh, UI here, we can go into cash flow. We can see from the financing activities, we can show it by month, and we can see all of our inflows and outflows, our present cash on hand, the net change in cash on hand for any period of time that exists. And this is all reconciled in real time to your bank account. And so one of the things that I have often said to entrepreneurs, and I think I may have even bring this up, um, in, uh, this episode is that I think entrepreneurs, their first tab in their browser should not be their BI tool. It shouldn't be some marketing dashboard. It should be their cash flow statement and even better, a 13 week cash flow. I'm getting final loop to work on some of that, to be able to look out and see, do I have money? Is the money in my bank account growing or not? And if not, what do I do about it? And when you root yourself all into that space, it changes the way you view your business. So. Final Loop's an awesome partner. I hand select both these t people, y'all, because I care about this. Marketing, finance, and the overlap of people who are helping to solve us problems there. So they're here to help us do that. So thank you to both Final Loop and Zamp for doing this. Good for all of you in the attendee pool wanting to get answers. I'll make sure uh, that, uh, Rahid, if you're listening, jump into those Q&As and get yourself uh, some people who need help with that. All right. That aside, now, we're here to chat today about some of the challenges that uh, entrepreneurs and in particular bootstrapped and apparel businesses face in producing cash. Now, Robert, I want to start with you um, because uh, I believe you mentioned it, right? You guys are bootstrapped from the start. So no outside funding right. at all? Yeah, I got a family loan to start it out. And okay. like, just for some reason in my head, I was like, I got to pay this back immediately. But after I did that, it's funny, we're talking about cash flow, paid it back the first year and then Right nice. before a busy season the following year, I'm like, I don't have couch. What do I do? You know, I was 18 at the time, 19 when I started. Holy cow. Um, so I, I just was learning. So think thinking about cash flow after that, I was lived out of uh, Excel cash flow statement at the time. I was always looking at it. And after that year, that really changed a lot. And then since then we haven't needed any sort of loans or debts or anything like that. That's amazing, man. I I think I think there is something so powerful about developing that skill out of necessity. I like to say that a lot of time entrepreneurs are just like they're just evolutionary beings that evolve skills relative to the needs of the thing that they're doing. And that's a great example, but maybe can you reflect on sort of what makes that hard in terms of your business, what makes generating cash so difficult for an apparel business and how have you approached solving this problem? So other than making the cash flow statement, something you look at all the time, yeah. what makes it challenging and what have you done to help uh, solve for the problem? 
Yeah. So one thing that makes it challenging is you kind of touched on this earlier is we need inventory. If we don't have inventory, we can't generate sales. So it's always that like push pull of how much do we buy at, and it's seasonal, you know, like the apparel business just naturally there's these bumps around weather and seasons and activities. So we've kind of fallen to that calendar and we have long lead time. So our shortest lead time probably is like 90 days or 60 days. If it's something like we do all the time. That's but actually not for your category too. Yeah, it's just, it's real it's pretty good. Yeah. And I'd say like more typical, we're looking at like 120, 140, even more sometimes. So if you're talking six months out, you have to project and plan what you need. So that's always like a discussion between me and our marketing team and trying to understand like, what do we want to grow? Because during COVID, as quick as we were getting stuff, we were selling it. So it's kind of that balance of what's a measured risk, but also at the same time, making sure we have the ability to grow and we have the ability to scale when we do have that demand. Um, then generating the cash flow, kind of what you said, like we look historically at what we've done in terms of sales and revenue and like what we did to drive those sales. And we're always balancing, like increasing that top line, but also making sure our costs are managed like very, very closely. And that's what Josh has been in the account and like the marketing has been following so closely for so many years. So it's just ingrained in like how we operate and what we do. That's awesome. So, so Josh, this is one of the debates that I have a lot with people is what is marketing's role in forecasting? Uh, I think it should be a marketing responsibility because we control the inputs that drive the outputs. But tell me how you participate in that process, forecasting and demand planning at bare bottom. And how does marketing play a role in it uh, for you guys? That's a good question. I, I think uh, a lot of it is looking at product categories. Um, our first like five years, we pretty much had like 80% of our, our, of our sales going to two products, our shorts and swimsuits. Um, so we found a lot of growth. So just through expanding the catalog, finding that product market fit. Um, so a lot of our forecasting continues to go into how do we expand the new products? Where are we seeing our current products and those, you know, the t-shirt collection, long sleeves or short sleeves, uh, athletic apparel. Um, and seeing, you know, which products are we hitting on ads? Is it a creative problem? Is it a product problem? How are the reviews of the product? Are people buying a second item for it? Are, you know, is it, more, is it more first time customers? Is it more return customers? Maybe it, people were only wanted to buy it on sale. So maybe it's a price thing. Um, so I think that's where I, I come in to try to give that perspective, but, um, I, I need Robert help a lot on it because he's so, um, attached to the supply chain minute to minute, like he said, it's 90 days. So he knows exactly what's going on. It's changing always. Um, so he's, he's super involved in, you know, even the, the week to week ad spend per collection. That's, oh, that's awesome. So you guys, you guys have a view of spend per product category all the time. Uh, we, we have it in more per product, but we okay cool. get it through collection too. Interesting. Do you do that through like, cause so this is, this is something that we, we try to bring to the table for residents a lot is do you do that by destination URL? How do you actually sort the spend by product category? Because there's this sort of classic, like people can buy different products off of a different link. Like how do you actually think about assigning spend to product? We'll look at, uh, uh, siloed. So we'll look at just which ads are getting the most spend and scale at, with a good res, of course, and then where the actual sales are going. Um, because even if the product isn't the one that's driving sales for that product, if it's if having it online, is going to drive more sales. Though typically it seems most people are buying the product that they're landing on. Yeah. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's like, you know, it's still a little opaque. Cool. So Robert, tell me a little bit about the team. Um, around you that helps with the supply chain and finance side of the business? Like who else supports in that process for you guys? And it sounds like you're really connected to the supply chain. Talk to me a little bit about that process. Yeah. Um, so we have somebody, his name is Emmanuel. He's our director of sourcing. So he oversees like all the product development, helping work with the factories, sourcing factories. He's been in the industry like 40 years, but in terms of work experience, he has like 70 years just because the number of hours he's worked. Um, so he's just like a wealth of knowledge and really helps like drive a lot of the direction. Um, and he's been one of the secrets to how like we're able to keep our cost of goods so low because he work, we work with the factory so closely. Like we have strong partnerships. It's not like we go here, place an order, go here, place an order. Like we get a ton of value from long-term partnerships with our production partners. Um, so, you know, we are able to help them become more efficient, lower our costs, help with lead time, that sort of thing. 
Um, and I just personally like am drawn to production. I like enjoy the aspect. I like seeing how fabric's made. I like everything with that. So that's just like a natural interest of mine. Um, and product development, like a lot, of, like I said, we're designing products for ourselves. So like, that's something I'm always focused on looking at product and we really care a lot about what people think of our product. Like we're very confident in it. Our return rate is extremely low. It's like five, 6%, which in apparel is pretty much unheard of. Um, and our customer reviews are awesome. Like anytime we get a review, that's not a five-star review. I get it direct to my inbox and so does our COO, Megan. And like, those are being read and they're being shared with like who needs to read them because we truly believe in our products and like, we want to continue to make product that people love. So being product focused is super important. And then you kind of talked about the finance side. Um, I've pretty much been doing that since we started just out of necessity. And I've kind of kept it because I wanted to grow the business in other facets. And like, I felt the financial side of it, if we had a good understanding of it and we had our numbers and kept our cost under control, it wasn't like we needed to do anything super crazy. So I've been able to manage that to this point. Um, and we just focus on like growing our fulfillment team, making sure we're, you know, shipping orders on time, customer service, uh, growing ad team out. So like, you know, when people send a chat, they're actually getting a response because they're getting, first of all, they're driving a lot of revenue when they are responding to that, but customers who have problems and we can help them and we try to do the right thing. Like those customers love us. And it's like, you hate to have someone have a problem, but if you can help them out afterwards, it just adds so much value. So. For us, customer service has like been really important. And then we've grown like our e-commerce team a little bit more with the website and then marketing is obviously huge for us. Like Josh and I were talking recently. Sometimes we feel like we're almost a marketing company, even though we sell clothing. It's just so ingrained in everything that we're doing. That's awesome. Um, Josh, one of the things that I'd be curious in terms of your interaction with product development, one of the things that I see is attention in apparel tends to be that marketing always wants new and novel. Uh, and even on your website, I see right now, like new arrivals, new colors as like, so that the whole page that always helps from an advertising perspective. But the tension with that is that the easiest thing from a supply chain standpoint is to just have less skews, less colors, less complexity. So how do you guys think about the balance between new and novel and exciting short run colors and limited edition, et cetera, versus nope, let's sell the core black pants kind of vibe. And how do you think, uh, the relationship between marketing and supply chain fits together in that one? Uh, yeah, we actually, I think we talk about this a lot internally as, uh, um, because we definitely see those, those peaks, uh, you know, with sales, whenever we launch a product and we, you know, how we keep pushing the core products, um, for us in the, from an advertising pr perspective, I think it's showing the products in different lights, uh, you know, and to different customers and di you know, different customer segments. Uh, we know we only have a point something percent of the market of people who are buying clothes and, you know, in the U S where, where we sell. So. Um, I think showing the different value that you're getting from the clothes that we are already making. Uh, but also I think there's an in-between, uh, one new product where we take our core items and, you know, we have a new print, a new, a new shade for the season, but something where, um, we can, uh, face our old SKUs and bring in new ones. So it's not necessarily always adding room to the, uh, the warehouse, which is limited. So, you know, it's something we're always looking at. Um. One of the things that I've seen uh, apparel businesses do that can minimize risk of product is to figure out good strategies for liquidation when necessary. I'm curious, how do you guys think about aged inventory? When do you think is the right time to move it into discount, to liquidate it? Like, how do you think about the relationship between uh, driving positive profit and contribution versus, hey, we got to fix the balance sheet, get back into cash and purchase? How do you guys work through that discussion together? I'll let either of you sort of take take a, take a shot though. Yeah, I'll start. And then Josh, if you want to add anything to it. Uh, so, so this point, honestly, because we're on a three PL, we've been blessed in a way that the inventory costs us whatever space it's taking up and obviously the cash that's tied up into it, but we haven't really had a point where we're like out of space in the warehouse. So we've kind of just been like, all right, let's sit it. Let's have it here. We're naturally selling it and we've kind of progress and we'll do little sales here and there, but we try to honestly have like good, strong price and value throughout the year. And we don't want to discount our product often. Um, just because we do feel like we're giving a good value throughout the year. Um, we've done certain things that are product focused or targeted emails to try to move some inventory. Uh, but in terms of like a liquidation type thing, we really haven't done that. Just 
or doesn't align with our strategy super well. And I know you're going to say like, Hey, you have cash tied up. You can turn it over into something else. Um, so that's a discussion we've had a little bit more now, but for the most part, if it's a product, we're happy with the quality and we're happy with like the actual product. We haven't felt the need to liquidate. There are things where maybe we have like inconsistency in sizing, for example, or like we improved a fabric. So if we have the old one, you know, people are going to be unhappy with that. So that's a time where we've looked into discounting and like bundling stuff where, you know, you buy two, you get one or something like that to move volume. But, uh, we also look at like end of season sales as a little bit of a way to move stuff, but we just hit on it. Like a lot of our products, we're not like a fashion brand. We obviously try to come out with new colors and things that people want and wear, but it's not like we're making things that are super, um, like trendy. So that next season, we're not going to go off them. So if we have like a basic, uh, like pair of underwear, for example, like we're not doing anything that's super crazy with that, or like a long sleeve shirt, that's pretty standard basic that people just like want as an everyday essential. We don't feel the need that we have to liquidate that super quickly. Yeah. And I, I can say, uh, from the marketing perspective, uh, I think we do a good job at, um, looking at the history, the data, the market, and then like Robert, I mean, you and Megan have a good like intuition on how much we need for a new product for for the first order of inventory and get and then looking at the ads uh and looking at just the sales and that, that sell through rate to understand how much to get for that second order but like the first component is what's the minimum we need in that first order to have enough inventory to learn um you know with a little extra on top and then you you have a good understanding of you know it's gonna take 90 days or whatever it is for that specific product so how you know do we need to flex the caps like do you have a little more specific like and ads to learn faster or like, do we have more time on that? Or if it can be a little ahead of season, like there's so many components I think we're, we're thinking about both in just like the general seasonality of when people are buying, but also, uh, like what, what season the clothing is for. It's great. So Robert, the several of our, your cash conversion side, so you mentioned the lead times. Have you had success in negotiating terms with suppliers? Do you use any inventory financing? Tell me a little bit about how you're able to sort of manage the, the process of buying and realizing cash in the, in the supply chain side. Um, so we negotiated terms with suppliers. Like I said, we work with these partners for years now. Um, I think our, the person we've worked with the longest is now going on like eight years, seven years. So it's a pretty long relationship. Our terms are definitely not like our main focus though. When we're working with suppliers, it's like getting the right product, getting the right quality and getting it on time. Like, you know, the finances are there. Um, the longest net payment I think we have on the terms are like 60 and that's pretty rare. It's usually we'll do like 50% on delivery to our warehouse and 50% 30 days later. And if we can swing it, we always pay them up front. Like, you know, we have those terms, but if we have the cash and we're in a good position, we try to help them out because we know they're financing it on their end. So. You know, doing things like that when we're able to, and then when we can't, we tell them and they understand, you know? So I think doing things like that and trying to treat people really well has been helpful. Um, in terms of like inventory signings, and we've never done like a line of credit or anything like that. The banks tried shoving it down. Like you have to get the line, you have to get the line. You don't know when you're going to need it. But I think part of those long lead times gives us a little bit of an advantage where, you know, of course we have the risk of we're making this purchase, but we have all these core products that we're you know, we're ordering up front and if we don't sell them this season, we might have to sit on them, but at least we know they're going to sell and we're taking those bigger risks for scale with our core products. It's very rare that we'll, you know, take a big risk on inventory on like new styles or something. Obviously it's something we're pretty confident in, or it has like a huge hit immediately in ads in particular, then we can jump right back into it quickly, but we're turning it over relatively quickly because of the seasonality of apparel. Um, so it's not like we're sitting on inventory for super long, usually. Yeah. That's interesting. So, okay. So 50% on delivery, 50%, uh, another 30 days. days later. Okay. So that's still, you're still able to get started on sell through prior to, to having yeah. to pay some of that back. That's great. Five to 6% return rate in apparel is really good. Obviously men's tend to be better than women's. I think it's probably just cause we're lazier, but, uh, uh you guys, Andrew products awesome, I'm sure. But, um, so those are both real value propositions. I think that definitely help you guys in terms of doing that. Um, so, so thanks for sharing that. So Josh, uh, you, I heard you say it briefly, or it's sort of my, my radar went up in terms of how you're managing the ad account. Um, so one of the things that 
often apparel represents is the margin profile. The LTV might be different by product category and customer. And so it tends to fight against the generalized meta idea of just consolidating everything down as simple as possible, running one massive uh, account with everything in it, because you have to manage the inventory. You have to manage the margin. How do you think about your job on the ad side as it relates to mapping across everything you guys are trying to do? Yeah, our, our isn't super complicated. Uh, we, we, we have a couple more than one campaign. Uh, I can say that, uh, but we, we do, uh, move out like a, a you know, high LTV products and we do testing in there to see if it, you know, if it doesn't really drive, that's a big thing we've, um, been trying this year to understand, you know, we see it in the data, it drives, uh, you know, these specific products or these questions are going to drive high LTV. Um, but do they really, if we bring in people to buy them from the ads and uh, we've seen, it's not always the case. Um, and then I, I think a lot of it is just the number of creative that we're making and ads we're making for specific products that we need to hit. So there are certain styles that we know have a higher margin. So we're going to tr try to make more creative and see if it can win out. Um, when we've tried to divide it into too many campaigns, we've learned it and, and, and it ended up hurting us overall. So I think a lot of that focus goes into retention also. That's where we can really, uh, upsell to different products and, um, you know, get a wider range of, of sales from, from our collection as we keep building. What is your guys LTV? Like what's your one year LTV on a customer as a percentage of A or B? As a percentage of A or B, I'd say. Like 130 percent, Robert. That's awesome. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, like we, I like to think the gold standard apparel is like they call it 30, 100, 30 percent in 60 days, 100 percent in the year. So especially in for men's, that's that's amazing. So you guys can start to hear the profile. Like what I always try and do in these conversations for those of you that are listening is start to dissect the genetic components of the kinds of business that produce cash, yeah. low return rate, good terms with suppliers, high LTV, disciplined acquisition. Right, you can start to see how you get to a place where you produce cash. Um, so one of the questions that's come up, or I'll throw this to you guys too, is about channel expansion in the future. And this also tends to introduce complexity into demand planning and harder things like that. So one of the easier ways to manage cash is to keep it single channel and get really good and disciplined with that. You start introducing wholesale, retail, those things move on different cash cycles than others. It introduces more complexity. So. Why no Amazon? Why no Huckberry? Why no retail or wholesale for you guys yet? And is that a plan in your future? Um, I think the main reason we haven't like looked into that, I mean, obviously we're aware of it. We've looked into it, but we haven't gone the direction. Amazon in particular, um, just their fees, I feel like they're not super aligned with our business model. So that was like a big deterrent for us, especially like such a high cost compared to how we do things. Um, so that was the original thing, but in terms of like wholesale and retail, uh, we feel like we have a lot of room to grow direct to consumer. Like that's just the truth. Like whenever we go into a channel, like and they talked about channel expansion, we want to feel like we've saturated or we've gotten, you know, 85, 90% of what we can do without putting in like a ton of extra work to get that little incremental lift. So we know what other people are doing in e-commerce direct to consumer. So we feel like there's a lot of opportunity to continue to grow in that route. It doesn't mean like we won't do wholesale or retail. It's just, we want to push ourselves to achieve uh, a higher goal and higher revenue in this channel. And, you know, if we're seeing like, okay, this isn't working or, um, you know, we need to change what we're doing maybe in those channels or how we're advertising that sort of thing. And we're like, okay, we've kind of feel like we're maxing out what we can do with our current setup. Then we can determine, do we make a big change in terms of power marketing or do we change channels and add the channels kind of like you said, but if we do something, we want to be able to do it well. It's not like you just go open a wholesale account and you know, the person running the website is handling that. Like, that doesn't make sense. It's like you said, there's a lot that more that goes into it. It changes our distribution. It changes our fulfillment process, which we have designed for direct-to-consumer and super lean and super efficient. So changing that isn't impossible, but it's just, is it worth, you know, kind of that change in process? That's great. Yeah, I think, I think taking your time and really ensuring that when you make that next decision that you're ready and prepared to resource against it appropriately. And cause it does, it does introduce a lot more complexity into the business when you see yeah. expanding. Um, Josh, I'm curious about your marketing calendar and how you think about slamming moments, product releases relative to the cash cycle. Like one of the things I see businesses get in trouble with is they'll have these key moments, let's call it Q4 and maybe it's, you know, father's day or like there's these sort of built-in cultural tent poles 
but the period leading up to them, September, October, might be really low. And so you get into this tension of, I have to make a big inventory PO in an era where uh, my business revenue is actually down and it creates tension. And so our advice is often to help people think about how they can plan, we call them peaks, ahead of those moments or to compound them over time. How does your planning of the marketing calendar as a leader relate to sort of the flow and cycle of the rhythms of the business? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. We, we have been uh, heavy on new product releases in the last pretty much two years. So it feels like almost every week we have one or two new releases. So that's been like a really constant way to always have some type of a new thing to show. Um, but we, we put more effort into trying to figure out what, you know, where we can make our own things, uh, our own calendar, uh, peaks, uh, one big one for us is like our 11, 11 sale, which isn't super popular in the U S. Um, but we found that it's a great way to prepare for black Friday. So and kind of learn, um, what creative is working and what messaging is resonating with customers. Um, father's day is big for us, uh, the holidays, obviously. Um, but also I think because of our seasonality on the retention side, we can sell a ton, you know, we can sell to new customers, our shorts and swimsuits. And then when it hits to October, September, oh, did you know, we also make sweaters, we make hoodies, joggers. Um, so give us like a second peek for those new customers. And then you see the same thing for uh, the people who buy our winter stuff. Then we send them the summer stuff. That's cool. So I want to add to that because it's an interesting point. Like early on, um, like Josh said, we started selling just shorts, right? We're in Florida, like shorts year round. We saw that like huge peaks spring, summer, and then it would just crash. When I first started, I'm like, oh my God, it's over. Like this business is going to fail. Like I'm not selling anything. And then the next year it came back. And I think now I think I'm better about it. For probably for the first like seven, eight years, I just have thought like it's over. Like no one buying our stuff anymore just because of like, no matter what you do, like there is that seasonality. And that's when like the product expansion helped and like Josh looking in the account and being like, you can't just put an ad and force people to buy it. Like they have to still yeah, right, right. So that, that's just like a funny thing. Cause you said, you know, you're making this big purchase, which you have to for, you know, Q4 Black Friday in particular. Um, but I think getting over that, like if you believe in what you're doing and like you, you need to look at the history because it always does come back. And there were, you know, February's or March where we had colder weather. We're like, it's not coming back yet. It's not coming back. And then like that, when the weather snaps, it does come and people are doing spring break. So. I think looking at your historical data is super important and having that understanding of your particular business and like what makes it work outside of the numbers is super important because there are times where you kind of just have to go off your gut, honestly, like the data might not necessarily say like, this is going to be successful, but because you know your business better than, you know, Excel does in some aspects, of course, Excel is better in a lot of ways, but um, you know, just knowing your business and understanding it, like you can make those gut decisions, which I think are super important in things like this. Yeah, I think I think it's so important. One of the first things we do with Barry's is often we'll just pull a visual for them of your revenue by week over the course of the calendar. And you know, you often have these natural peak moments that are sort of built in or seasonality relative to the product category. But then inevitably there's a valley. There's some period that is the natural low moment. And so a lot of times the question is, what could we do? to offset that valley? What new product could fit into that season instead of the previous one? What cultural moment could we attach ourselves to? What you know idea could we come up with to try and raise those periods? Because they often, um, the peaks tend to also be to be accompanied by valleys that are really depressing and are really hard. And you have to buy in the valley. That's the problem. You have to place that PO for the peak in the valley. And so it feels like, oh my God, this is so risky and terrible. So uh, that's, a, that's often a, a challenging consideration. Uh, okay, a couple of questions, Robert. Back, back to you. how do you plan to create liquidity for your shareholders? Like, is your goal to distribute cash every year and just keep growing the business? Do you want to sell one day? How do you think about actually getting the money into the pockets of the people that own the business? Um, I mean, we definitely want to just continue to grow the business. Like, that's a main point. Obviously, somebody recently asked me. I said we want to be a hundred million dollar business, top line, and they said why? Why that number? I said, you know, of course it could be 94, 97. Like it's not that a hundred is the perfect number, but I feel like at a hundred million, first of all, we want to grow because everyone on our team, I want them to grow personally. I want them to grow financially. Like outside of that though, we have such a large impact on the people we work with. Obviously our giving back initiative, like if we grow, we can do more good in that sense. So that's super important to me, but also at the same time, like 
the factories we work with, they employ hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of people. And throughout the supply chain of apparel in particular, it's unbelievable how many hands have to touch one t-shirt or one pair of shorts. So that's like how I was introduced to the industry was going to a factory when I was in high school and seeing like how it can shape an economy, how it can help people. And that was like a main thing. So I think at a hundred million, I want to continue to give bigger orders to our partners and help them grow and help the people who work there is one side of it. But I think we can keep the general operation that we have and the general team and like the structure at that point. But I think once we grow past that hundred million is where we might have to tar start talking about bringing in, you know, different layers of employees or different processes and just probably changing the culture a little bit. Doesn't mean it's a bad change. But I think that's the point where we're like, hey, what strategic change do we want to make as a team? And does this make sense for how we want to operate as a business? Um, and I think that's really been like what's driving our growth is those two parts. And like an exit was never my strategy. Like, again, when I started it, I was just in college and I was like a business, you sell stuff, you make a profit, that's the money you made. Um, and then throughout the, you know, as we grew and especially after COVID, once like private equity apparently found out what e-commerce was for some reason, like getting emails every day, Josh getting emails and we were like, we want to do this. Like we like everyone, it's grass is always greener, which is interesting. Like we were like, oh, it'd be so nice to have this funding. And then you talk to people who have funding, like I wish I was bootstrapped. Like I'm always answering calls from these people. I'm kind of beholden to what they want, even though I still own the majority of the business. We have to hit these metrics. Like if we don't hit metrics, the only person who's going to be upset with us is ourselves. And, you know, we obviously don't want that, but it gives us the freedom to make decisions that are better for the business long term, as opposed to like, oh, this quarter, let's like hit this number so that we can make this person happy who's thinking a shorter time horizon. Like we don't have a date where we need to sell by, or we don't have like a three to five year timeline to recoup our cash or investment. So I think that's kind of like what's been driving our growth and, you know, the direction for the business. It's cool. Um, it's nice to have a clear sense of the impact that you're making and to remind ourselves, I think so often entrepreneurs can grab lots of different scoreboards all the time to measure their success. And, uh, it's not, I don't hear very often that your sense of impact to your partners and the people that you're shining by is an important value for us or uh, for you. So that's, that's cool. That's really cool to hear you. Um, Joshua, I'm curious, 2025 planning, thinking about your team, the incentives, how you define your own success. What is your incentive in the organization? How does your job get measured? And then how do you pass on those goals to your team? Can you describe a little bit about how you guys do? That? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're looking at how many new customers are we bringing in and are we growing our retention? It's pretty simple. Um, in terms of success and Robert does, uh, set the standard for, for me, uh, you know, we'll, we'll forecast together what we think, here's, here's what we think is going to naturally be the retention next year. Okay. Now what can we do to push that? What are the channels we haven't tapped yet? What are the strategies? What did, what did we do? What did we learn this year? Like that we could build on and then so we get some, some sense of our works, especially after doing it for, you know, eight, eight to 10 years, we have some idea of what impacts we could have. Uh, and then the team's really small. So that almost just goes directly from Robert to everyone. And we bring everyone in pretty, it's really open, uh, which I think uh, people really appreciate that. Um, they can ask questions, the books are almost open for everyone to, to understand what's, what's going on. New customer acquisition, are you guys first order profitable? Yeah. So again, building the genetic picture first order profitable, 130% LTV in a year. That's called an ATM machine, folks. That's like how you build a business that produces a lot of cash is that you're disciplined in your acquisition. You have a customer that compounds in value by introducing a lot of great product that they want to continually engage with. You stay lean on the OPEX side. You have good terms with your suppliers. That's, that's the recipe. Like a lot of people right now, there's a narrative that e-commerce is not a business model that can produce success. And it's just nonsense. It's utter nonsense. It is a great business model. You just have to be thoughtful about the way in which you execute it and understand the mechanics that make it work. So understand those inputs. First order profitability, really good LTV, lean OPEX, good supplier terms, good margin on your product, low return rate. Like that's the profile. You do those things and your business will produce cash. So um, super cool. All right, we've got a couple of questions and then we're gonna go lightning round. Um, so Brian asked, uh, if it's Yanks versus Dr. Taylor, who are you picking? Um, 
I'm trying to turn my kids into Dodgers fans because it's our local team. Uh, so we're definitely going to a game. I'll say that. That's my dream is Yanks Dodgers. And Brian also says that Josh, you look like Carlos Rodon. So that's I hit the side side note, pitch up for the Yankees. All right. And then for you guys, Robert and Josh, what's your biggest challenge that you're facing uh, this year? Uh, I can actually start this one because it connects directly to, I think, what you just asked and what we were talking about with the first order profitability. Um, so yeah, the benefit of, of it is the, the cash flow is always there, but it's also going to be the main factor in, uh, at least for us right now, in, in uh, g- pr- uh, giving us challenges for growth. We can't just yep. raise our budgets. Yep. Yeah, everything is tough. Ta- you know, we always say when people ask, like, which, you know, we'll have our partners at, at Google or Meta, they'll ask, what's your spend next month? What are you planning? And our answer is the same every time. It's we have our guidelines. This is our tag, our row as we want in the platform. We'll spend unlimited. Uh, luckily, we, we have the inventory for it. It's a big part of it. Um, we we what we would like to spend two times next month, at, but we need to just get the scale at the same efficiency. We can't flex that at all. Uh, so that's, I think, our biggest challenge in figuring out is it a product, is it in other channels, with the creative, and then just testing. Biggest challenge is keeping those predators at those platforms out of your out of your muddle too. So keep impressing you. So besides that, but. Uh, that's good. Well, I agree. That, that's the tension, right? If you're going to be disciplined about holding that constraint, growth in each new tranche of growth becomes a little bit harder. You got to be more creative, come up with more new good ideas. And that's, but that's such an important boundary to force marketing teams not to just raise the budget. Like that's such a low brow way of solving a problem, right? It's just not actually a solution. And so that's the good work that that constraint is really what forces the innovation of the team. It forces them to go find new and creative ways to solve problems. And so good on you guys for holding it. Um, Robert, what about you? What's the biggest challenge you're facing? I think right now is it's because we're trying to expand our product profile. We've grown our SKUs by so much. And it's just like striking the balance of how do we widen our net and, you know, offer more products, but at the same time, not just spreading ourselves too thin where we have all these products. It's too hard to, because we're direct to consumer, like we can't run an ad for every SKU we have. We can't have a, expect a customer to look at every single product on their website all the time. So it's finding a good balance of offering enough products so we can combat the seasonality, we can get people to repeat purchase, we can bring in new customers because of that product offering, while at the same time, like being able to stay lean, not having to liquidate inventory, not having to devalue our product and brand because we took all these risks that we're not able to convey and like get customers to purchase. So I think finding that balance of how many new products we have in terms of like fitting our current customers and also bringing in new customers and making sure we're not just like going crazy and buying everything we see. Yeah, that's, that's good. That is, that is the, that is the tension, right? Like that's how you get in trouble too much of stuff that whether it's uh, seasonal or anything else that ends up just sitting there and there's no obvious way to move it. Um, awesome guys. All right. Lightning round, a few questions that I've tried to ask everybody, uh, uh, in this series, what's your home screen on your dashboard right now? What, like the first thing you load up on your computer, what do you look at? Mine's down the lane, but it's my email. Email first guy. All right, Josh. Mine's like a, it's some extension. I think it's momentum. It's just like a, a nature landscape. Well, I mean, not literally your background. Like what's the first thing you look at every day is the, the home, home screen, in your browser. How about that? Like for home oh, first, I, I look at our life timely. Uh, blended our eyes every, yeah, probably first thing. Great. Um, do you guys have a shared bonus pool for your executives or financial incentive amongst the group that you all move towards? Is there any common role? Yeah. I mean, it's all tied to the business growth. I wouldn't say it's like we all have the exact same, but everyone's pay is pretty much tied to growing the business. Question for each of you. Do you think Bear Bottom's current media budget is too high, too low, or just right? Josh, you go first. I'm going to say it's probably too high. Can we can definitely do better. Robert? I think the budget's too high, but I want it to be higher. So that's the tension. That's, that's a great answer. That's a very strong answer. It's like, which really is like, I want it to be endlessly scalable and endlessly more efficient. Always. That's the, uh, that's the game, right? Um, one tip that you guys would each offer to e-commerce businesses to improve their cash flow. What would you offer them? 
I think do more yourselves. I feel like in e-commerce in particular, it's so easy to freelance so much and like rely on partners and third party and this and that. I think when you do it yourself, it's often cheaper. And if you're really willing to like put the time and up people who are people, like you kind of said, true entrepreneurs who like to learn and like to iterate and out of necessity, you end up doing it better than a lot of other people in certain ways. Obviously there's experts who are great at things, but for e-commerce and like smaller businesses, there's so much you can do and because you understand it and your business, it helps you so much more like in the long run. I think that's the main thing. Yeah, I, I, I'd be skeptical of best practices, especially for platforms. Just you, you have to verify everything for your, your own business. Everyone's different. Um, and don't trust, you know, all the numbers that you're seeing. <laughs> investigate everything, understand it as clearly as you can. All right, everybody, I appreciate you guys coming in. I, with the series, repeatedly, I feel a responsibility to surface these stories, stories like bare bottom clothing of businesses that are taking their time, they're growing intentionally, they're doing it thoughtfully, and even in a category as complex and as difficult as apparel, they're making money. And they're able to grow the business without having to take on venture dollars, without taking on a bunch of debt, um, and they're doing it with intention. And you heard the attributes, good for short profitability, great LTV, good terms with your suppliers, nice margin, or small return rate. That's it. That's the profile. So go and investigate your business, whether it's looking at four quarter accounting, diving into your unit economics, whatever it might be, there is a path forward. There's a way to make your business healthy, sustainable, to alleviate the stress and have it produce cash for you. So guys, I appreciate you being willing to share your story with the industry. I think the more of these that we can service, bootstrappers, doing a great job, building a business they love and enjoy to be a part of. E-commerce only is still a thing that I think gets such a bad rap. Um, so I appreciate you both. Congrats to the work that you're doing and you're building something special and keep leaving it in. Appreciate it. Glad we get to share it because I keep, like to say, we don't, you don't hear many people talk about it. So it's cool to get to see more people talking about it. Yep. Appreciate you all. Uh, where can they follow you guys? Are you on Twitter, LinkedIn? If they wanted to see more about Bear Bottom, where could they uh, check you guys out? Yeah, bare bottom clothing everywhere. That's it. That's you're at. Just brand, just the brand guys, just the brand guys. I like it. Well, I appreciate it. Josh, Rob, thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank the time. You, thanks for Good stopping time. in.